Welcome back to A Week in the West End, the show that takes you behind the scenes of Theatreland. And here's what's coming up today. We get a backstage pass at the musical Chicago and catch up with former cast member Ruthie Henshaw. Alistair Appleton talks to Vanessa Redgrave and Jack Davenport about their new West End roles. And the Manchester City under-21s and women's team give us their score to a night at the theatre. Now, who'd have thought that a musical about two melodious murderesses would have been a big hit on both sides of the Atlantic? But Chicago is about two ruthless young women who polish off their partners and go on a rampage after fame and fortune. And believe it or not, our very own sweet Miss Sweeney is playing one of the dangerous divas. And she got you a backstage pass. Here you go. My baby, my baby and me. We're about as happy as babies can be. What if I find that I'm caught in a storm? I don't care, I'm babies there, I'm babies bound to keep me warm. We're sticking together. Hello. This is my dressing room, and apparently Roxy's dressing room is one of the best in the West End. But I've got someone here who will tell us more about that. This is Ruthie Henshaw, and she originated the role of Roxy Hart in what year? Uh, the, the, the 1997 or something like that, about four years ago. <gasps> so is it the best dressing room? Yeah, it is. I mean, most dressing rooms in the West End are like the size of a cupboard. And uh, this one, as you know, has a huge bathroom too, <laughs> like with a bath and a bidet, which is unheard of. Um, normally a nasty little shower with mould on the curtain and that's it. The wonderful thing about the part of Roxy is you really can bring yourself to it. Yeah. Roxy has just oodles of room for being able to just bring your cheekiness and whatever your personality is. And is that what you like most about the role? The yeah. freedom? The I mean, freedom. it's the Belma and Roxy, there's a lot of freedom with both, isn't there? Very much so, but I think with Roxy, it's much more the, the acting role. Mm. I think Velma's the kind of, like, show busy, you know, you get the entrances mm. and the exits and the one-liners and that kind of thing. It is, but you know what? I'd have forgotten how big it is backstage. This is actually much bigger than I remember it. The good thing about this show is it's not about the sets no. or the costumes, is it? No. Everything's black and simple. I mean, in fact, there's absolutely hardly any set. It's just a bandstand. And no one changes costumes except Roxy and Velba. But come and have a look at some of the things we use. It's just chairs, bowler hats, and this is the main thing that Roxy uses. <laughs> Roxy Rock Chicago! Get the picture and also <laughs> just observe the fact that we're not actually sure what language it's written in. But you're <laughs> yeah. standing there with your paper reading a load of rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> There's a load of rubbish. Roxy Rock Chicago! I think one of my favourite numbers in the show has got to be All I Care About Is Love With The Feathers. Oh, Remember yeah. that? Yes. The fans. Such beautifully simple. Uh, Absolutely just, gorgeous, isn't it? So works. Hit it! I don't care about expensive things. Cashmere coats and diamond rings don't mean a thing. All I care about is love. That's, That's what he's here for. Memories, eh? Yeah, wow. Take your eyes off, oh dear, eyes off. Let's see. Yeah. Great, okay. So well done, Odette. <laughs> <laughs> Always Hello. 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 
Vanessa oh, is yeah. the original, one of the original dancers who worked with Ruthie. How are you doing? Good. Oh, my, my goodness. Nice to see you. Don't, was it three years? Oh, God, yeah, probably. Three years. Oh. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Do you want to go as well? well you <laughs> know, I've always wanted to do it. Listen, we're going to let you carry on with the rehearsal right. and just set our front. Is that OK? okay. Yeah, fine. Brilliant. Nice I'll have see a chat later. Yeah. <laughs> It's a gorgeous theatre, isn't it? Don't have your feet. Good girl. Push off. OK, Liz, great. So it's just got to be a bit quicker, OK? okay. But that's really well done. Right? That it does look good. fun, but it must be so high. I think it's harder than it actually looks, looks isn't it? Yeah. A few splinters in the old bum at that, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Ooh. So, Ruthie, what inspired you to get into the business? Um. I think it was possibly because my mother was a drama teacher and a film and television teacher. And uh, so she, and part of her curriculum was MGM musicals. And uh, so we had a video and all these piles of MGM films. And uh, I remember watching them and thinking, that's what I want to do. It was just a passion immediately. So what was your first leading role in the West End? It was actually in Cats. Was it? Yeah, my first West End. It was, I was a kitten in Cats, but I, mm. I played Grizabella. I really got my big break when I did Crazy For You. I'd done some lead roles before then, you know, but, you know, Les Miserables and Miss Saigon, but when Crazy For You came about, it was those MGM musicals on stage. I remember standing on the stage on the first night and thinking, life cannot get any better. It really can't. It was just incredible. Ruthie's back later in the programme to sing a number from Crazy For You. Now, not a lot of people know this, but in London, more people go to the theatre than go to football matches, whereas outside the big smoke, exactly the opposite is the case. And to remedy that sad state of affairs, we carried out a little experiment. We took the Manchester City under-21s and ladies' teams to see how a night at the theatre would score. Manchester City's Football Youth Academy, where young hopefuls are brought on under a strict training regime, their ultimate goal is to be signed to one of the major clubs. These lads live and breathe football, but not one of them has ever been to the theatre. I've never got round to it, but I've never had an interest in going. No one's ever invited me in. Even when I was in school, no school trips or anything to the theatre was never arranged. Personally, if I said to my friends at theatre good night out, they'd look at me and think, no, sorry, I'm not coming with you. I just think it's for more, you know, mature, sophisticated people. I just don't think that it appeals to people of my age, really. Well, it's just probably because it's not uh, in fashion, really, to go. You wouldn't say, oh, yeah, well, I like the theatre and I like football. People wouldn't really say that one, not the people I know, anyway. And it's not just the boys who love football. Man City have a ladies' team. Once the girls have finished their weekly training, they're off for a good night out. And that doesn't include a trip to the theatre. A night out on the beers is my idea of a good night out. Um, probably starting in a pub, meeting a few friends, going on um, to, a, to a club, maybe a kebab or a curry at the end of the night. But if the manager's watching, we don't do it on a Saturday. <laughs> I think it's all to do really with how you grow up and how you're brought up. Uh, quite working class, really. So, you know, it's football, sport, go to the pictures, things like that. And also, you know, it's very expensive and a lot of the people that I mix with couldn't afford, you know, £35, £40, whatever it is for a ticket. In actual fact, the theatre can be value for money. Manchester is the number one touring venue and since November, Miss Saigon has been selling out at the Palace Theatre. The cheapest seats here are £10. That's £3 less than the cheapest seats to a Man City match. And to see if we can prove to football fans that going to the theatre is also a good night out, we're taking both teams to a performance of Miss Saigon. How do they think it will compare to a football match? Or as opposed to, you know, being at the theatre, if you know the plot, then it's never going to change. So, you, you know, you might as well just, just come out after five minutes, you're going to know what the ending is anyway. I can imagine I'd be quite bored, but I can only wait and see. At a theatre, you, you have to just sit there and be quiet for the whole duration of the show, whereas if you're at a football match, you're free to do as you please. You can get up, go and have a pie, or you're just more involved in the whole day, really. The excitement, everyone's on a high. They can shout, they can cheer. The adrenaline's pumping, yeah, it's exciting. I just think yeah, it's a special feeling when, you, you know, when you're watching football. Natalie Anglesey is a well-established critic 
who has spent her career promoting theatre in the northwest of England. They should give it a go because when you go to a football match, what you're seeing, you're seeing two teams playing one off against the other. You've got passion, you've got excitement, you've got talent, and all of those things can be seen on stage in a theatre at any one time. It's not easy theatre. It's not a happy, clappy musical. They can't sing along with the songs. It's not Grease, it's not Saturday Night Fever, which they may already have seen on film and be familiar with the story. However, it is directed very cinematically, and I'm hoping that that will get them, because it's very fast, short, sharp scenes, and a lot of exciting action. I don't know if it's quite a mixed people, really. It's not really what I expected. Three pounds for a programme. <laughs> It's like it's football, it's like it's city. For the next three hours, they'll be transported to a world of war-torn Vietnam. Starting off in a girls' bar, they certainly weren't expecting that. You'd never see anyone singing live um, on top of the pops, like, with anywhere near a sort of, that sort of quality. So I think, um, you know, that, that was something that you really noticed, that they can all sing really well. I thought the performance from everyone was really good, especially the engineer. He, he brought a bit of humour to it as well. Yeah. The scenery was good. I liked the helicopter in the car when that came out. I thought I'd find it boring, but I actually found it quite interesting. Didn't expect it to be too brilliant, but it was superb. I don't think it's, as, it's better than football, but, you know, I enjoyed it, and uh, it was a good experience, and I, I'd come again, I think. So, the Olivia Awards are on Friday. We're giving you the chance to vote for your favourite show. Here are the four nominations. Cats. Based on a series of poems by T.S. Eliot, Cats opened in London 21 years ago. It's the longest-running musical in both West End and Broadway history. If you want to vote for Cats, call 09001. Double four, double seven, o one. O nine double o one double four double seven o one. Mamma Mia. The songs of Abba were the inspiration for Mamma Mia, a tale of family and friendship set on a mythical Greek island. If you want to vote for Mamma Mia. Call 09001-44-7702. The Phantom of the Opera. The Phantom of the Opera opened in 1986 at Her Majesty's Theatre, where it has played over 6,000 performances. Set in the Paris Opera House, it's a story of unrequited love. If you want to vote for Phantom of the Opera, call 09001-447703. 09001-447703. And finally, the Reduced Shakespeare Company. The complete works of William Shakespeare, Abridged, is a show where the audience has taken through the playwright's 37 plays in 97 minutes. It's currently the longest-running comedy in the West End. If you want to vote for the complete works of William Shakespeare, abridged, call 09 001 44 7704. 09 All this week, you can vote by telephone for the show you think deserves to win the Audience Award for the most popular show. Calls cost a maximum of 10 pence, and lines will close on Thursday at 5 p.m. and the results will be announced on Friday's programme. Performing in a show eight times a week can be physically exhausting. I can speak from experience on that. But as an audience member, you deserve the best performance for your money. So if you come to see a show specifically for the star, what are your rights if they're off? You've seen Denise Van Outen shimmying in Chicago, Daryl Hannah scratching her seven-year itch, and Anna Friel in Lulu. Kathleen Turner, Nicole Kidman, Jerry Hall and Linda Gray have all been seen on the London stage bearing significantly more than their souls. 
Over the last few years, there's been hordes of Hollywood and TV celebrities just desperate to strut their stuff on the West End stage. And theatre producers here love that because big names mean big houses, which means big bucks. Celebrity names may be splashed all over the theatres, but recent no-shows from a number of screen stars have hurtled the issue of absentee leads into the headlines, raising the question of whether or not they can actually cut it on stage. Martin McCutcheon and My Fair Lady um, obviously attracted an enormous amount of controversy because, poor thing, she was off very early on. Um, the sad thing was, when she was on, she was truly fantastic. She, you know, the, the reviews she got for her first night were justly deserved, and the reaction she got from the audience night after night was justly deserved. She just simply wasn't well enough. It was, one, it was a, an error of timing. It's not to say that had she not done it in two to three years' time, she wouldn't still be on and still doing it now. It was one of those things she just didn't have sufficient time to recover. There's an incredible amount of responsibility having your name above the title of the show. And, of course, everyone expects you to be there because they're buying tickets to see you perform. Uh, from the other side of things, I'm expecting to be there too, but, of course, you're only human and there are some shows that you miss. We go to great lengths to try and contact people if we know our leading artists are not going to be in. If they're build artists, if they're people whose names are above the title, we'll advertise in the newspapers, classified ads, display ads. We'll try and contact people if we have telephone numbers. And then there's always the last resort of the, of the large sign in the foyer. I still get letters now saying, I came to see the show and you weren't there and I feel terrible because some of them are coming in from all around Europe or travelling down from Scotland. They've organised time off work and hotels and... I just can't imagine how disappointing it would be. I also had friends that had flown all the way from Australia to see me perform and I had to say to them, I can't go on because I'm too sick because at the end of the day, I don't want to give the rest of the audience a bad show either. I think you've got a responsibility to do your best. So sickness has struck and you're not going to see the superstar you wanted to. So can you get your money back? We offer people refunds in advance where it's difficult is if people come to see the show, elect to come in and see the show, and then say afterwards, she wasn't on, I want a refund. Invariably, if you question those people and you say, you know, did you actually enjoy the show? They go, well, yes. Did you have a good time? Yes. Well, in that case, why are you asking for your money back? Remember, theatre is a glittering, illusionary, but also deeply human endeavour. And human performers sometimes get sick, so while the show must go on, it'll sometimes go on without your favourite star. But that's a risk that you take. And hey, you never know, the understudy might be a star in the making and you will have seen their first performance. Ray! No, I haven't turned down anything that I've regretted, no. I've done a few things I've regretted. But I haven't turned down many. <laughs> I got sent the script of Mamma Mia when they were originally auditioning. And I read it and I thought, this is awful. This is absolutely shocking. I wouldn't go near this in a million years and I didn't audition for it and boy did I feel a fool. I've taken roles that I regretted taking but uh, no I, I don't turn much down. He lied. I've regretted not getting parts but I don't think I've ever turned one down and regretted it. I turned spend 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 down and spent the next seven months out of work. <laughs> no. Mm -mm. I've turned things down but I've, I've never regretted it. I've been worried about turning certain roles down because I never say no, usually. And you don't, you know, in this business. If you're offered something, you say, how lovely, thank you very much, I'd love to do that. No, I've never turned a part down. Can't afford it. <laughs> Previewing tonight at the Haymarket Theatre is the revival of a play which opened over 100 years ago, Lady Windermere's fan, Oscar Wilde's first theatrical success. <laughs> Wilde died in 1900, yet his plays are as popular as ever with audiences and actors alike. We join Sir Peter Hall's star-studded cast rehearsing for a play that comments on Victorian social values. It's a story about what a mother is prepared to sacrifice for her daughter. Lady Windermere's Fan was written in 1893 and it was Oscar Wilde's first major success. And I think I can see why. I love this play. It's very, very, very unusual for that period, and I think it's still pretty deep. I think that it's a play that's compelling and interesting to put on now, as opposed to 1893. It's about loyalty and it's about betrayal, 
and it's about love and how those three things can get very, very confusingly intertwined and possibly cause great sort of heartbreak, really. You said you would be my friend, Lord Darlington. Tell me, what am I to do? Be my friend now. You realise quite quickly that Oscar Wilde was a genius, and I think emotionally he was way ahead of his time uh, in terms of the kind of social values he was either exposing or promoting. Oh, how do you do, Lord Augustus? You've quite neglected me lately. I haven't seen you since yesterday. I'm afraid you're faithless. Everyone told me so. Now, really, Mrs. Erd, allow me to explain. It is old-fashioned by definition, but it's still about people and it's still about emotions. And it's our job, really, to, to make it feel contemporary. I think it, its age is irrelevant um, in the same way that I think, you know, the age of Shakespearean writing is irrelevant or Marlowe or anyone. Those plays are still done and stand up because of the depth of human emotion that they explore. This woman has the place that belongs by right to you. Go! Go out of this house. With your head erect, with a smile upon your lips, with courage in your eyes, all London will know why you did it, and who will blame you? No one. And if they did, what matter? Wilde is known for his wit, but in fact, I think why he is probably the most commercial um, dramatist after Shakespeare is because he has a huge heart. He is very, very warm-hearted, and I think audiences like to spend um, an evening of their lives thinking of major problems uh, and seeing a generosity of spirit and a, and a compassion. They also happen to be funny, which helps. I don't know what to do about Mrs. Erlin. She treats me with such damned indifference, I might be married to her. The play is about a mother and a daughter, or a daughter who doesn't know that the mother is her mother. I think the fact that we've got Vanessa Redgrave and Jolie Richardson doing it will give a, a tremendous resonance. You are right. You have no courage. None. <sighs> give me time to think. I cannot answer you now. It must be now or not at all. I'm very excited that Jolie's playing Lady Windermere because I think she'll be simply extraordinary. Oh, You're right. You're terribly right. But where am I to turn? There are people in this who are kind of at a fairly legendary status. It's a sort of pleasure to watch them work as, as much as anything else. And that's actually one of the nicest things about doing this job is watching people who've been doing it for a very long time do it very brilliantly. It's not intimidating, it's generally quite inspiring, really. Normally, I mean, the last people I want to know about normally are relations. I can't bear them. The only thing I'm interested in, actually, is the rehearsal process. I don't like going to see my own work. I don't like going to see my own plays. I don't like sitting in an audience, actually. Well, if, if even Tuppy is... <laughs> they are. Uh, and I think it could be a little, a little bit coarser. Why I think theatre is important is because it, it is, obvious cliché, live. There's imagination in theatre. That's why it's precious, why I think it will actually not only last, but get more important. And it's the only thing we all do now in our society where we imagine together. You can't explain anything. It is your chief charm. Now, we're giving you the chance to win tickets for a top West End show if you can answer this question. Who choreographed Chicago? Was it A, Tommy Tune? B, Jerome Robbins, or C, Bob Fosse? If you think you know the answer, call us on 090 11 120 100. Calls will cost 25p and the lines will close at midnight. The winners will be announced on CFAX page 617 on the 20th of February. Here's what's coming up on tomorrow's programme. We've got an exclusive backstage pass view at The Lion King. Penelope Keith tells us about her latest West End role. A very starry lady at a time when stars were stars and very much had their own way. And be prepared to be scared witless as we visit the set of the thriller The Woman in Black. <laughs> we're leaving you with Ruthie Henshaw singing Someone to Watch Over Me from Crazy For You. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.
love is blind Still we're often told Seek and ye shall find So I'm gonna seek a certain lad I've had In mind Looking everywhere I haven't found him yet He's the big affair I cannot forget Only man I with regret I'd like to add his initial to my monogram Tell me where is the shepherd for this lost Tell him please to put on some speed. 